Well, welcome back. Uh, you're part of the number one public university in the world. That's pretty exciting, right? And I guess I'm trying to sort of think things from your perspective. It must be amazing to be able to experience being a student even for a day at Berkeley. I wish I had this opportunity. I graduated, I did my undergrad in Athens University and I've never been back since, right? There is nothing like that happening. So this is a privilege and an opportunity. I'm very happy for you that, to be back at school. And maybe this is one of the ways for you to remember why you love Cal so much, right? Um, in terms of who I am, um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm originally from Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and I've been at Berkeley House since 2010. Um, I do research, 80% of my work is research, 20% is teaching, and I've been doing work in the intersection of accounting, finance, economics, and law, right? So really trying to sort of create opportunities for what I call intellectual arbitrage, right? There is so much to be learned by intersecting ideas from different disciplines, right? I've been working with MBA students, speech, the students, and executives, and I love them all symmetrically. <laughs> Uh, in terms of uh, UC Berkeley Executive Education, and that's the plug from uh, Mike Riley, our CEO, I've been running the program of financial data analysis, but I'll give you a little bit of the scoop in today's session. In terms of my teaching and research philosophy, just so you know how I think, I'm going to try to sort of infuse as many Greek words as I can in one slide. <laughs> my mission is to move from analysis which is the specialized knowledge of a specific discipline to synthesis, to synthesize ideas across different disciplines, including accounting, finance, economics, strategy, operations, marketing, law more recently, right? So what I realized after I joined in 2010 is that we academics tend to get siloed uh, and we don't really talk to each other, but there's so many opportunities from just opening up the conversation with other fields and disciplines. Um, in terms of the second kind of axis of my philosophy is to move from theory to practice. I'm an academic, so I believe in the value of having a framework. I believe in the theory, but at the same time, what's the point of having a theory unless you can sort of have an impact on practice, right? So I'm trying to bridge the gap between academics and practitioners. Um, the last thing is, I don't really have many answers, but I do have a framework to frame questions. For me, what's really important is asking the right question, because once you define the question, most of the, most of the problem solving has been done, right? For me, financial analysis is a framework to think about data, but also something to think about, okay? So it's very important. So if you wonder what keeps me up at night, um, I care about questions such as what is the fundamental value, the intrinsic value of a corporation, and what's driving corporate value creation? I care about how prices reflect fundamental values and how the two ideas are related to each other. I care about financial education and how can financial education facilitate individual investor decision making. So my research and teaching takes the point of view of all investors, but I care especially so for individual investors. How can financial education help promote efficiency and, and improve the allocation of capital in society so that we improve social welfare for everyone, right? So it's not just about making money, it's about democratizing access to financial education so that people make better decisions and everybody's better off. So you can kind of think of me as a Mother Teresa in a suit. <laughs> So in terms of the agenda for today's session, uh, a few things. I tried to kind of uh, summarize things that I covered over 15 weeks of a regular teaching semester in 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so I will start with an introduction to the stock market. I'll talk about corporate value creation. Given your experiences, you'll have quite a bit to add to the discussion in the stock market. I'll talk about financial analysis in action. I will have a couple of applications of financial data analysis in practice, and then I'll talk about the future of financial analysis and financial education. Finally, I'll give you access to a few additional resources because one of our principles is to, for you to stay student always, right? So I want to give you a few ways for you to kind of realize this idea. Excited? Yes. yes. How excited? <laughs> Very excited. I recognize a few people in the audience, starting with um, one of my very, very first students. Bernie, tell your story. I didn't know. We, I we didn't you plan that. We didn't plan that. Yeah. No, I, did, I didn't know it was your first class. You you were so amazing. 
But you said you were very nervous teaching us, and well, we didn't I know. Well, back in uh, uh, August of 2010, I had just graduated, and it was my very first class that I ever taught in my life. <laughs> and I remember I went to the classroom like an hour in advance, trying to warm up the classroom, right? <laughs> kind of making sure that the whiteboards are clean, the markers work, everything, the projector is functioning, right? <laughs> And I remember waiting for the class to start, and I think you and Heidi uh, were the first students to show up in class. And you look at me, and you say, that was nine years ago. I was much younger <laughs> and, I, and prettier. <laughs> at this point, I'm halfway amortized. <laughs> but like, you see me, you say, are you the prof? And I think you kind of grab my cheek. <laughs> <laughs> I was hiding. Yes. You didn't have any great hair then. I know, I know. But that was kind of, that's kind of how, that was my very first experience of teaching MBAs, right? Because I remember starting the session, I'm like, oh shit, you know, how am I going to uh, communicate authority in class? But it, wasn't, it was not an issue because our students are more about substance over form. They didn't really care about my accent or how I look or how young I might be back then. They care about substance. So, it was amazing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. And then I recognized Chris, right? So that was so when you graduate. 2016, so it's been a while, but I was still younger and more energetic, and I remember we had this uh, student presentations, and uh, we had a photographer that showed up from the marketing team on the day of the presentations, and I, I still have some of these photos, I cherish them, um, um, and in most of the photos, you're in the background. Uh, you're, you're in the background, you're laughing your ass off, which is great. <laughs> So anyways, we, with that, I, I want to start with a question of what is a corporation? And typically my sessions are interactive, so here's my question, what is a corporation? And there is no right or wrong answer, so well, what do you think is a corporation? I think it's a collection of projects where there's some upfront investment and then different financial and strategic returns. That. that sounds pretty good. Bernie? It's a legal entity, a board. Uh-huh. So it is a legal entity that is separate from its owners, the shareholders, right? And if you think of the corporation, the corporation is a legal entity that has rights and responsibilities, right? Like most of us, right? They can enter into contracts, hire employees, own assets, and of course pay taxes. Uh, being great, talking about taxes is a very emotional topic, right? We don't like paying those. <laughs> Um, and of course, the shareholders have the right to participate in the profits and they have bounding liability. In general, corporations come in two flavors, public corporations and private, private corporations. Private corporations are those whose shares are not publicly traded, whereas the public corporations are those whose shares are publicly listed and traded. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, quite a bit about the public corporations just because they're more salient, they tend to be bigger and we have more data that we can work with, right? Private corporations are amazing and most of the corporations are private, it's just access to data for outside investors is restricted because public corporations, by the virtue of being publicly traded, they need to file all these quarterly and annual reports with the SEC every quarter and year, so we have access to quite a bit of information. Examples of public corporations and those that come to mind are those that tend to be bigger and more successful. I'm going to start with Apple. What do you think is the market capitalization of Apple? It's over a trillion dollars. Over a, How many billions is a trillion? <laughs> how many millions of millions is a trillion? It's quite a bit, right? So just to put things into perspective, you can think of the size of Apple as five times the GDP of Greece, <laughs> or actually 5% of the US GDP. So any way you cut it, this is a big number, okay? And this is not the only corporation that is joining the trillion dollar club. There is other corporations such as Microsoft, and with 
trillion dollars in capitalization. Amazon, Alphabet is very close to that. And when I talk about capitalization and size, I take the point of view of all capital providers, not just the equity capital providers, but equity plus debt capital providers, because that gives you the sense of the enterprise value. Right, so these are very large corporations. And what's happening over the years, if you look at the distribution of firm size, the distribution is getting skewed to the right. So there is a dominance of very few large corporations. Actually, in some of our research, what we do is we try to explain variation in the entire stock market. And you can look at the top 10, top 50 corporations in terms of size and capture 95% of the variation. Welcome. 95% of the variation in the entire stock market just by focusing on the top 10, top 50 corporations in terms of size. So this is pretty crazy, right, in terms of how large and how important these corporations are for overall economic activity. Now, Facebook, this is a half a trillion dollar club, right? So it's getting there and it's been on the news. But even if you think about the capitalization of Facebook, that's a pretty large corporation. Now, the stock market, how do you think about the stock market? And let me give you a hint. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the stock market to you? <laughs> In my classes, I call, call people. What do you think? Yes. I saw you coming, you were kind of late. <laughs> What's that? A meeting place for willing buyers and sellers. Okay, so it's a marketplace, right? So this is a marketplace for willing buyers and sellers, <laughs> sellers of what? Apples and oranges? No, shares of corporations, right? You can think of the shares as slides of ownership in the corporation that gives the right to participate in the value creation. And of course, nicely it comes with limited liability, right? Which is a great feature. Now, if you think about the, 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 the size of the US stock market, it's over $30 trillion, and I guess like three of those trillions is the top three firms in terms of size, right? But this is a big number, and most of the capitalization is related to firms listed in the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and Amex. Just to give you a sense of the history of the US stock market relative to economic activity, here is the ratio of the stock market value over the GDP of the U.S. starting from the 70s all the way to today. And what you see is relative to the level of GDP activity, the value of the stock market has been on the rise. And that was true. Most of it happened in the 90s. And then you see during the Great Recession, that contribution of, uh, of the stock market to GDP declined, and now it's up on the rise. But in more recent years, if you compare the size of the US stock market to GDP, uh, the, 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 the stock market is 1.5 times the GDP of the US, right? So these numbers are very important, and that's why we care about the stock market. It is related to economic activity, and it is driving economic activity. And that's why it's important to analyze and understand how these stock prices are being formed. So here's my first real question to you. What do you think is the market value of the corporation? What does it really capture? What is the market value of a corporation? And of course, you know, we can't be talking about the market value of a private, we can't talk about the market value of a private corporation, but I want to think about the market value of a public corporation, a corporation whose shares are listed. So what is the market value of Apple? What is the market value of IBM, of Microsoft? How would you perceive that concept? Use the mic. Expected by whom? By those who get to participate in the market. So if this is investors, so you're saying that the price, the market value, reflects investors' expectations. Expectations about what? Future. About the future, the future of what? Hmm? Assets, maybe? Well, you can think about the assets in place or how assets will behave over time, right? So you can think of the market by being reflecting the amount of capital invested in the firm plus expectations about value, the future path of value creation, right? And that value will be created how? Products and services. Products and services that will generate what? It will generate profits and? and sales, right? So you can think of the market value as kind of the, oh, and we don't have a marker. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? 
If you can give me a market, that would be great. But you can think of the market value as kind of the intersection of supply and demand. Because you can think of uh, the demand for the shares of a corporation, the supply of the shares of a corporation. So let's start with the supply of shares. So the supply of shares of a corporation, the number of shares outstanding in the corporation. Can this number change? Yes. yes. How? In two ways. First, issue new shares. If you issue new shares, what's going to happen to the supply? Supply will increase. If the demand doesn't change, what's going to happen to the price? The price will drop. Now, of course, you know, managers know that, so they are more likely to be issuing shares when? When the demand for the shares of the corporation is high, right? So think of Lyft, think of Levi's, think of Uber, think of Pinterest, right? Think of all these companies. When do they issue shares? When people are willing to buy those shares. Right? Of course, you know, a corporation may issue shares to raise capital to finance investment, but that path is very expensive, right? You can always finance investment by raising debt financing, right? So one way to change the supply of shares is to issue new shares. Can you find a way to decrease the supply of shares? How? Buy back shares. If you buy back shares, the supply will decline. If the demand doesn't change, what's going to happen to the price? The price will go up, right? The price will go up. But when do companies buy back shares? The wrong Say that? At the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> when, they get when there's a Republican so tax. So that managers have been on average, right? Of course, there's always cases that deviate from the average experience. But the average experience shows that managers have been pretty good in terms of buying back their shares. And they tend to buy back their shares when? When the price is low, when the price is low. One example is Apple. They spent billions of dollars over the last couple, couple of years buying back their own shares, right? Effectively reinvesting their own company, right? And that was the study their buyback program when the price was $90 per share, and now they're up to 200 So that was value creating for the shareholders who chose to stay with the company and that was value that was created for those who stayed with the company at the expense of those who left the company. Now, what is amazing about the market value is that for a public corporation, we can actually look it up. So you can all look up the price per share of Apple, the price per share of Microsoft, the price per share of any listed company, right? So market value is actually observable for the public companies, right? Now, if that's market value, what is the fundamental value of the corporation? What is the fundamental value, the intrinsic value of a corporation? And is it the same as the market value? How many of you are affiliated with public corporations? How many of you are affiliated with private corporations? What about the rest of you? <laughs> <laughs> Not Did profit. Well, for non-profit organizations, and I'll get their financial data analysis is equally important. Yeah. Many of my students actually are, affi are, affi are affiliated with the healthcare sector, and, um, uh, and financial analysis is very important because unless you look at the numbers and you understand where, where there is opportunities for efficiency, you know, it's, it's an issue. But when it comes to the fundamental of a corporation, of a public corporation, or a private corporation, what is driving fundamental value? expectations expectations about the future path of value creation in terms of growth and profitability so unlike market value fundamental value is unobservable and here's my definition is what can be justified by the facts so for example how much capital is invested in the firm and a set of assumptions about the future path of value creation so what do I know based on the historical data and what I expect in terms of value creation, value that will be added to capital invested over time based on a set of assumptions. Now, the trick is that these assumptions have to be reasonable, right? So I just came back from class, we were covering Tesla, right? So ah. we, so which we're trying to value Tesla, and of course, you know, when it comes to the facts, we know the financial statements, we know the amount of capital invested in the, in the firm, but trying to estimate fundamental value, what value will be added to the capital invested in the firm, is very tricky because the path 
to buy your creation in terms of profitability and growth is very uncertain, right? And my objective was to infuse a few sanity checks so that our students come up with stories that make sense, right? Of course, there will be many stories that make sense, but at least it's important to eliminate stories that don't make any sense. Okay, and that's why it's important to have a framework. So market value is observable, fundamental value is unobservable. Yes, please. So Remind me your name? Victor. Victor. So what is the value of Tesla? <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's very hard to come up with a value, but what I do and what I love doing, I start with the price. I'm like, is this what, if this is what people are willing to pay for a share of that specific corporation, what needs to happen for that price to be justified in terms of how, how many cars, at what price, at what margins, right, for that price to be justified? And I just did this exercise and the story behind the price, because price is not just a number. Price is the collection of beliefs of millions of investors. It's a story. An incredible story about growth and profitability and assets in place, right? And the story behind today's price is pretty amazing. It's pretty incredible in terms of what needs to happen for that price to be, ju to be justified. So what I always do, I start with the price, I reverse engineer the story behind the price, I see what people think in terms of the beliefs and betting in prices, and then I do what we do best in life which is criticize other people's beliefs. <laughs> okay? Does it make sense? Okay, good. <laughs> Let me talk about fundamental value drivers. Corporate value creation boils down to finding a path to earning a profitability rate in excess of the cost of capital. And I will have an example, you'll see exactly what I mean. But generate the return on capital that is higher than the cost of capital. That sounds pretty intuitive. And of course, generate growth. So you want to grow in a profitable way. You want to grow in a way that generates a rate of return in excess of the cost of capital. Growth percent, some of my students even from back 2010, they remember my quote, which is growth percent does not create value. Growth is a catalyst in the value creation reaction. It can amplify value creation if there is a path to profitability or it can amplify value destruction. So growth per se does not create value. There has to be a path, there needs to be a path to profitability and growth is a catalyst in the value creation reaction. Now, that may sound Chinese to you or Greek. <laughs> I don't wanna say Greek, it sounds schizophrenic, right? <laughs> Let me give you an example of what I really mean when I say that the path to value creation, the value creation boils down to growth and profitability in excess of the cost of capital. So here's my startup idea. I want you to promise me something that stays within the classroom. You're not gonna be saying this with anyone, so it will stay between us. So here's my idea. Do you follow? <laughs> We're gonna be selling one dollar notes for 50 cents. I'm gonna set up a website and I'm gonna be selling one dollar notes for 50 cents. Good idea, bad idea? <laughs> Think about that, would you buy my dollars? Yes. Would you? Yes. Of course, right? <coughs> of course, so what's gonna be my growth rate? <laughs> Phenomenal, <laughs> astronomical, wonderful, incredible. I'm gonna grow like crazy, <laughs> okay? But for every dollar I'm selling, how much am I losing? 50 cents, right? So I will never be able to generate a rate of return that is higher than the cost of capital because those dollars that I'm selling, instead I could be investing in a savings account, right? Or in an ETF that is giving me exposure to the stock market, right? So there is no way that I will ever generate a rate of return on this dollar that is in excess of my opportunity cost, which is, you know, investing my dollar in a different way, right? So there is no path to profitability. So good idea, bad idea? Bad idea. Bad idea. But A, I'm a Berkeley House professor. I can always pivot, right? <laughs> so there's some option value, right? So, so you don't know, but I mean, there is a possibility of me pivoting, right? So given that, who would be willing to pay a dollar for a 0.00000.1% 000 000 000 share in my startup? Who would be willing to pay $1 for that fraction of shares in my startup. It's not much, right? I remember, 
so many accolades, right, that come with me. <laughs> Berkeley House professor, you know, I should be able to come up with something. What the heck? Yeah. Who would be willing to pay a dollar for that kind of steak in my car? Dude. <laughs> I'll take cash. <laughs> Do you have cash? Do you have cash? He might be losing money on every sale, but he's going to mix it up in volume. Oh, yeah. you, no, no, no. I don't want to answer this. All right, so I'm taking that dollar. What just happened? Well, how many shares are there? There's one billion identical shares of that fraction in my startup, right? So if you're willing, what's your name? Emma. Emma. Okay, so if you're willing to pay that much money, for that kind of share, what you just experienced is the genesis of a unicorn. <laughs> Look at me. Lisa, add that to the list. <laughs> Thanks. So there you go, that's a unicorn. How many of you have watched the Silicon Valley show? Okay, well, you know what that stands for? No, Panos Palatukas. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another unicorn. So that happened. I wanted to share this with you because on Friday, Thursday was my birthday and I celebrated in class. And my students show up with balloons of FIA and unicorn over here. So these are some of my PhD students. And this is yet another unicorn. I don't know why I share with you, but I, I, you know, I look at you as my family. <laughs> So price versus value, why are we here? Well, let's talk about the relationship between the two. So market value is observable. Fundamental value is unobservable. It's, it's somewhat in the eye of the beholder, right? So it depends on what you know about the company and your set of assumptions about the future. So how do you think price and value should be related to each other? And there's three possibilities. Price and value are negatively related to each other. So the greater the value, the lower the price. They could be uncorrelated with each other. Doesn't really matter what the value is, the price will be something. Or they're positively correlated with each other. The greater the value, the higher the price. How do you think the two should be related to each other? It better be a positive relationship, right? It better be the case that more valuable companies, right? Fundamentally valuable companies have a greater market valuation. Ideally, how strong you'd like this correlation to be? 100%. Ideally, you'd like to think that the market value is an unbiased estimate of the true value of the corporation, right? Otherwise, public investors are, exp are exposed to the possibility of mispricing, right? Now, well, in theory, no. In theory, if the market is efficient, right, and that was the ide idealistic view of the 1960s before financial economists got access to data, that was the benchmark that the market is perfect, everybody's rational, nobody's making mistakes, and even if those mistakes happen, they tend to be random and small. So in the 60s, before the rise of data and computing power, um, academics, most of them based at the University of Chicago, kind of being tenured and not caring about the world, they kind of assume that the market is perfect in terms of the way it's processing information and the price is right. Now, if the, pri if the market is efficient, then the price is right on average, which means that the price is equal on average to the fundamental value, okay? So every time I ask you what is the, what is the value of a public corporation, the answer should be the price of the corporation. Because in a market setting where the market is perfect and complete, mispricings can happen, price can deviate from fundamental value, but those deviations tend to be very, very small and random. So there is no point trying hard to analyze data because you can get it all by looking at pricings, at prices. Mispricings cancel each other out on average, and price is a pretty good representation, actually a perfect representation on average of fundamental value. Now, in this market setting, in a market setting where the price is right, the price has to be our best guess of the value of the business. The price should be our best guess of the value of the business. So that's the efficient market hypothesis, this idea that the market is extremely good in terms of pricing securities. And that news about value spread out very quickly in the marketplace. So every time there is news that is relevant for understanding the ability of Apple to sell more iPhones at a better price, well, this news will find its way into prices in a 
perfect way and extremely quickly, okay? You can think of the market in this ideal setting as an incredible telecommunications mechanism that aggregates information that is dispersed in society and disseminates this information back to everyone through prices, okay? Clearly a very romantic, idealistic view of capital markets. Now, what I'm gonna do with you is I'm gonna introduce a paradox. So let's assume for a second that the market is perfect, okay? And I do this exercise with my students. So if the price is right, would you ever spend any time or should anybody spend any time analyzing, processing, and understanding financial data? Have you, have you ever seen the 10K of a corporation? It looks ugly, <laughs> right? And they're getting longer over time. Right, so would you ever spend any time reading the 10K and the notes of the financial statements and try to process and analyze financial data? Probably, no, why not? It's perfect, why should you uh, question it? Why question if it's perfect, right? You can get it all just by simply looking at prices, right? Why would you give up time, precious time, from spending time with your friends, <laughs> your family, Watching the playoffs, right? To do financial analysis, these are very costly choices, right? If you can just get it all by looking at prices, right? You will spend no time doing financial analysis, yes. The value of the 10K would be the management report on their view of the future. The MDA, the management discussion is extremely important because it starts with the historical data and then you see the story that the management is communicating, right? I always look at the management discussion and the guidance, but in conjunction with the historical data because there's a huge self-selection issue, right? How do you choose, to, how do you end up becoming the CEO of a company, right? You gotta be different, right? And you gotta be optimistic. So I always look at what they say, but I always interpret it with a grain of salt because I know that by their nature, they tend to be optimistic as they should. And it is our job to de -bias some of these discussions. Now, in this market setting, if you can get it all just by looking at prices, right? Well, nobody would bother to do the financial analysis, right? Nobody would bother to do the financial analysis because everybody is just taking the price as given. But if nobody does the homework, if nobody does the homework in terms of analyzing, aggregating, processing, and analyzing data, how can the price be right to begin with? It's not just a magic thing that just happens. Somebody has to crunch the data and understand the economics of the firm, the operating, the investing, the financing activities, and this information then will be incorporated in prices through the trading activity, right? So this is a paradox, because if we live in a market setting that is perfect, right? And the price is right, nobody will do the financial analysis. But if nobody does the financial analysis, how can the price be right to begin with? Do you get it? So what's the takeaway here? What, I mean, what if your philosophy in certain markets is, you know, what something's worth is what people are willing to pay? Well, let's talk about Snapchat. Snapchat went IPO two years ago, right? It was trading at $25 per share, today it's trading at 11. Let's go back two years ago, GoPro. It was trading at, right? It was trading over here, now it's at down there. A few years ago, Fitbit. Before that, Groupon. Before that, Zynga. Right? I can sort of keep going, right? So it is a few, it's not always the case, and I'll, I'll go through the motions here. So here's the takeaway. It better be the case that the market is sufficiently inefficient for investors to be sufficiently motivated to do the financial analysis. So in other words, in theory, one would expect that prices should be off somewhat, in some cases, for people to be sufficiently motivated to give up time from their spending time with their families and watching the playoffs to do the financial analysis so that they get compensated for their time. And that's very important because what it says is that people should be signing up for my class. <laughs> okay? So the market has to be sufficiently inefficient for investors to be sufficiently motivated to do the financial analysis. So in theory, 
this idea, this idealistic view of the world as perfectly efficient, we can sort of, on philosophical grounds, kind of take that down. And of course, after the 60s, with the rise of data and computing power, there has been tremendous amount of research, academic research, that shows evidence of inefficiency. Now, this evidence of inefficiency is not random. Actually, it's more likely to happen in cases where investors are less sophisticated in terms of their ability to conduct financial analysis, and these are mostly individual investors, and among companies that are hard to analyze and hard to arbitrage away. And I'm going to return to this issue. Now, today's view, it took us 100 years of academic research to kind of tell the obvious is that the market is pretty good, but there is room for improvement, right? Market values can deviate from fundamental values. Deviations are not random. They're more likely to happen when there is more room for speculation, more room for valuation error, and they're more likely to happen when arbitrage is constrained. Individual investors, this is the other piece of evidence, individual investors, retail investors, everyday investors are more likely to overpay for speculative companies, which is an issue, right, because what that says is that when the individual investors trade and they lose money, somebody else benefits, so what you have is a transfer of wealth from small individual investors to more sophisticated investors, right? So part of what we're trying to do is we use financial education to educate individual investors and try to, try to mitigate some of this transfer of wealth. Okay? Questions? Yes. Victor. How, how has, uh, what extent are ETFs affecting the It's very interesting, uh, and the answer as to what is the effect of, pass of the rise of passive investing and the rise of ETFs on price efficiency, as it always is in social sciences, the answer is it depends. Okay, so what happens is that that debate is still going, but there is an interplay between passive investing and active investing. So it, there, there, there are cases where actually the rise of ETFs has actually amplified price and efficiency, but there's other cases where the rise of ETFs has facilitated price discovery. So I'll give you an example. So I've been tracking my research microcap securities that get big enough to be added to one of the mainstream indices, the Russell 2000 index. When those companies are get picked up by the index, What's going to happen immediately, mechanically, the passive investors, the ETFs, have to rebalance their portfolio and add those securities in their index. Once they do that, ETFs, the way they make their money, because the management fees are very low, what they do, the ETFs, is they become suppliers of those shares in the securities lending market. So some of my friends, friends who are short hedge fund managers, they're waiting for the reconstitution of the indices, and they target those microcap secu securities when they're added to the index, because now they can short the, the securities. So it's pretty... It's a pretty dynamic setting, but my prediction is that over time, in spite of the rise of passive investing, there's always going to be room for active investing, and passive and active investing will interplay with each other. So we're not going to reach an equilibrium where 100% of investors are passive investors, because when that happens, effectively we assume that the price is right, but if everybody assumes that the price is right and nobody does the financial analysis, how can the price be right to begin with? So in equilibrium, I think we're going to have both, and there's going to be an interesting dynamic between active and passive investing. Okay? Now, what is the role of financial information analysis? It's a framework to think about value creation in a variety of settings. It can serve investors to make better decisions, but also can serve society in terms of promoting price efficiency and improving the allocation of capital in society. Now, financial information analysis, at least the way I teach in the MBA program, is not just about stock picking. Stock picking is the last thing we do. Financial analysis is important for insiders in public and private organizations and not-for-profit organizations because at the end of the day, you have to know your data. You have to understand the financial data of your organization. You have to be able to tell the story behind the numbers and you have to be able to tell the story with numbers, okay? Now, I'm gonna have a couple of applications. The first one, is related to our discussion of some of the speculative companies. I want to talk about how to understand hard to value companies. Okay, I want to talk about Snapchat. How many of you know Snapchat? Have used the application? 
Okay, well, I only use the application for the purposes of the class because I had to have an example. So it's an image messaging mobile application using computer vision technology. That sounds pretty amazing, right? So the technology is interesting because it's scanning your face, locates different features on your face, coordinate, creates these coordinates, and then at the end of the day, it applies those silly filters. Okay, so here's an example. Here's another one. So that's all it does. Now, the company was listed in the New York... <laughs> and then the message is splitting, right? So the company was listed on the New York Stock Exchange in March of 2017. Many people, and some of them were not in my students, but were Berkeley students, they were buying the stock because they liked the mobile application, they liked the silly filters. Now, of course, for a company like this, when they went IPO, their growth rate in sales was over 600%. 600%. Think about it. It's crazy, right? Can this be sustained forever? No, because if they were to continue at 600%, they would take over the industry and then it would take over the US economy and then it would take over the world and then they would keep going, right? So that 600% that growth rate was unlikely to be sustained. But of course what people do is they start with the current trends and they extrapolate them too much into the future just to be disappointed by the part of normalization, right? And some of my students probably still remember this path to normalization, right? But this path to normalization, what we call mean reversion, is just a force of nature, right? It applies to corporations, to organizations, it applies to urban environments, it even applies to our own growth, right? Think about my growth when I was a baby, and then I grew, and then eventually I will converge to zero, right? <laughs> but that idea of normalization kind of applies to everything and it applies to corporations as well. At the time of their IPO, they had a 600% growth rate and then in terms of their margins, for every dollar of revenue they had, they were losing 75 cents, right? So that's now pretty far away from my startup idea. <laughs> Actually, my startup idea would generate even higher growth rate and better margins. <laughs> I would only be losing 50 cents on the dollar. <laughs> now, when they went IPO, and that's not me making up stuff, right? When they went IPO, when you, you have to file what they call S1 prospectus, right? And that's available from the SEC website. In the SEC filing, before they went public, there was this discussion. We have experienced operating losses in the past, expect to incur operating losses in the future, and may never achieve or maintain profitability. <laughs> That was in the public filing. How do you, how, how do you feel? <laughs> I, I feel betrayed. How, how, really, how do you feel? Like if somebody says that, right? I mean, they probably say it for a reason, right? If it's in the filing, right, is it just boilerplate lawyer language kind of trying to hedge the risk of litigation in the future? Well, maybe it's there for a reason. Maybe they will never achieve profitability, right? And two and a half years later, well, guess what? They're still bleeding money. And in this case, the more they grow, the more they're bleeding. Because go back to my startup idea, right? So suppose I launch this website, I sell $1 notes for 50 cents. The more I grow, the more I lose, right? So growth becomes a catalyst for value destruction. Do you see that? So what's the best thing I can do? Cart it, stop doing what I'm doing, right? Stop selling these freaking dollars, right? <laughs> Cartel operations, right? That's the best thing I can do to my investors, right? Stop growing, yes. I, I was gonna, gonna ask about that because once you're a public corporation, isn't, isn't your role for your investors to maximize profits? And therefore, if you take your unicorn public, don't you have to stop business so you can maximize profits? Or how does Excellent that work? Question. Excellent. Well, you know, th that's what I think, right? I mean, if we go back to slides, I, when I talk about the drivers of value creation, I talk about growth and profitability. It's not just about growth. It's about growing in a profitable way. And it's not just about profitability, right? I'm not saying profitability needs to be positive. It has to be positive enough relative to your outside opportunities, right? It's not just about achieving a profitability rate of 1%, 2% when inflation is running at 2%. It's achieving a profitability rate that is juicy enough relative to your outside opportunities, right? 
So of course, in the long run, it should be about growth combined with profitability. Now, this is just an expectations game, right? This is just an expectations game because when they went IPO nearly two years ago, I had my RMBA students value the company. Their target price was $11. At the time, the sell side analysts covering the company, their target price was over 45 uh, dollars per cent. I'm not taking credit for that. It's our students, right? And we'll, I'll show you the data and we'll see, you know, who was right or wrong. Yes. So, uh, this is how it works now? Okay. So, yeah. So, um, we sort of, you're saying that we sort of re rely on the more sophisticated uh, financial advice, uh, financial uh, uh, analysts to sort of guide the, the larger public if towards you the. Rely on them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what I'm saying is that in this company, for instance, there must be VCs and people who must have invested and we're supposed to sort of, how, why are they investing in this? Well, that's a good question. It's all about timing, right? Uh, and it's all about not having, you, you see how things have changed since 2010? So let's think about the timing of pre-IPO investors and VC investors. When they invest, they invest early on. Yeah. Right. By the time those markets are hitting the public capital markets, right, they're already realized a lot of their value upside because of the multiple rounds of financing, right? So the VC investors and the, many of the pre-IPO investors will be making significant amounts of money even if the stock price ends up falling in the aftermarket, right? And I'll show you the data, right? But it all depends on the timing. Now, the main concern with respect to many of the uh, uh, Silicon Valley companies is that they stay private for a longer period of time. And they stay private for a longer period of time because they have easy access to financing, right? So they don't really need the public capital market. So for many of the, te the technology companies that are now getting listed, this is not a fundraising event. It's actually a liquidity event for the pre-IPO investors, right? So we know that they're selling shares and they're entering the public markets not because they want to provide access to individual investors to their value upside, but rather because they want to cash out. D do you see that? Yeah. Why would they else um, raise capital at this point? Actually, many of these companies don't raise any capital. Spotify, when they went IPO, that was a direct listing. They didn't raise any capital. Slack. It will be listed over the next couple of weeks. It will be a direct listing on the New York Stock Exchange. They won't raise a dollar, right? They're just getting listed, okay? Does it make sense? Now, let me show you the data. First of all, that's an issue, right? That's an issue. Because if there is no path to profitability, right, then how can the value be justified? And of course, the discussion we need to be having is what's going to be the path to profitability. So let me show you what happened in the aftermarket. That is, after snaps that went IPO, what's the performance? So here's the data. So the blue line is the performance of the stock market index this March of 2017, the time of the IPO of Snap, okay? So as an investor, life is full of trade-offs, right? So here's one trade-off. It's March of 2017, you have a dollar. You can either invest in SNAP or invest in the stock market index, a passive ETF, an exchange traded fund that with nearly zero management fees will give you exposure to the US capital markets, the US stock market. If you were to invest that dollar back in 2017, today that dollar would be a dollar and 40 cents. Okay, the, the market has done pretty well after the you know, over the last couple of years. Now, part of it was engineered because of the tax reform. Part of it was engineered, well, part of it reflects fundamental performance. But the bottom line is that the stock market has done very well. So if you were to invest a dollar back in March of 2017, today you'll have a dollar and 40 cents. But if you were to invest the same dollar in SNAP, today you'll have how much? 50 cents. So what was the cost of that choice? How costly that choice was for investors that invested with SNAP back in March of 2017? How much did they lose? 90 cents, right? Because it's not just about how much you make, but how much you make relative to what you're supposed to be making. So over the same period of time, you could have exposure at nearly zero management fees or 40% return. So really the cost to individual investors was 90%. 90% negative return. You have a question 
Okay. You feel disappointed or happy. I don't know. <laughs> now, is this a special case? Is this just me kind of coming up with a special case that sort of doesn't really generalize? Well, this idea generalizes. This is actually consistent with more systematic evidence, and what we see is that individual investors are more likely to overpay for hard-to-value, hard-to-short securities, right? So the combination of difficulty of understanding what's going to be the path to monetize in this user base, hard-to-understand companies are hard-to-value companies, and there is, if there is more room for error, there will be more error. And we see that individual investors systematically tend to overpay for this type of companies. Now, there's several other examples of this fear of missing out. And I want to sort of move investors from the fear of missing out to the joy of missing out, <laughs> right? Because look at the joy of missing out, right? It would be 40% positive returns as opposed to neg negative 90%. That's the joy of missing out. Yes, so Berkeley. Has this changed since the dawn of the Tell me about your t-shirt. It looks like uh, the intersection of Berkeley and Heineken. <laughs> 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 you want to show the class? The people, people's republic of Berkeley. I got it. Okay. So, what's the question? So the question is: has, has this changed since the dawn of the internet? Because I, I, I'm old enough to remember a time before the internet, when companies had to have solid profits before they went public. And then I remember I was here. I was here, '97. I was here in the '90s. I, yeah. was, I was growing up in Greece. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, look at that. Yes. I mean, that sounds pretty. 90s to me, right? Yeah, that's like uh, uh, down on the internet. Uh, so, so it, it yeah. is an issue. It was an issue back then. It is an issue today. Yeah. Maybe it's not, it's not as pervasive as it used to be in the 90s. But I mean, the 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 truth, the reality is that there's many companies that are speculative and they're more more prone to mispricing, and that individual investors are more likely to fall prey to overpaying for these type of companies. So several other examples of this fear of missing out, and I want you to think about the recent market conditions, right, and what's happening in Silicon Valley, and how that's going to affect the, the life of all of us, right? So think about real estate prices in Berkeley five months from now when these lockup expirations will kick in and all these young millionaires will be buying property, right? Um, the real estate market is buckling up for what's going to happen a few months from now, but look at that. And tell me whether it rings a bell. We have incurred net losses each year since our inception, and we may not be able to achieve or maintain profitability in the future. Lift. 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 So that's from the S1 filing of Lift. Lift when I bill three weeks ago. Um, the, how did they do in the aftermarket? Yeah, so it's called a broken IPO in the sense that actually on the first day of trading the pop, the, the price went up relative to the offering price, but today's price, which is what, $55 per share, is actually below the offering price. Now, the price went down significantly since the company became part of the public capital markets, but that doesn't mean that the VC investors and the early stage investors are losing money because they're not entering um, at the valuation that public in the, invest, the general investment community is investing, they, they, they invest at a much lower price. Actually, if you look at Lyft and the number of rounds of financing they had, they had 14 rounds of financing, right? 14 rounds of financing, and of course, as we are getting closer to the day of the IPO, that price was going up. So at this point, there is quite a bit of room for uh, a decline, yes. So I spent two years um, after I graduated in 2014 and I worked a year in the US, but then I spent two years working at Ola in India. Mm -hmm. Ola is the left of India. I was right in the middle of a price war with Uber and the kind of money that we were throwing at, and my job was to uh, use uh, data science to create incentives for the drivers. So Uber at one point of time came up with an incentive that said, if you did, if a driver did 18 rides a day, then the incentive only was 18,000 rupees, divided by about 70 rupees. So it's about, what is it, like, I mean, $200 a day. And we were matching it. So this 14 rounds of, I mean, it's just a, it didn't feel good, it didn't feel right. <laughs> It didn't feel right. it, to everyone in the company, and that, we were just the thing, right? so if throwing money. Driver for such a long period of time before they hit the public capital markets, that creates a huge risk for public investors, yeah. right? Because they enter the game pretty late. Yeah. There was another question somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Can you say that systematically all disrupting companies will be overpriced when they IPO? 
Uh, I don't want to make that statement, right? Because there might be disruptive companies that will be fairly valued, right? But disruptive disruption comes with uncertainty, and, and great uncertainty comes with uh, more possibilities for error, and in combination uh, with lack of investor sophistication, can create conditions for overpricing. But I don't want to generalize that. But there is quite a few cases that fit the profile. Okay. Yes. Is that is that based on a Risk-adjusted basis. On a risk-adjusted basis, things are even worse, right? Because now, when I compare Snapchat to the market, that was before taking into account the difference in the risk profile of Snap versus that of the market. On a risk-adjusted basis, the spread would be more than 90 percent, because for you to be willing to invest in a riskier company, you need to be compensated more right. compared to the you market to rate. Return. That's right. So, so, so if anything, that was an understatement of the true loss. Okay, well, I mean, with all of this happening, and it's not happening 10 years ago, it's happening today, uh, I would argue that, you know, financial acumen is not going to hurt anyone, if anything, it can help, help protect individual investors. And of course, my question is, what's the role of the SEC in this whole process in terms of promoting financial education? And, and what, what we see in some of these filings, uh, are, you know, are at least, you know, uh, worrisome to me. Now, in terms of the role of financial analysts, what I want you to keep in mind, that goes back to one of the questions that was raised before, is that financial analysts are not in the business of protecting invest, individual investors. They're in the business of generating commissions for their investment banks. So they're salespeople. And they're, I mean, I'm not saying they're stupid, they're smart, they understand financial analysis, but their incentives are distorted, right? So when you look at the recommendations, when you look at the forecasts, those forecasts tend to be biased not because they're not getting it, it's just because their incentives are distorted because they're in the business of gener generating sales as opposed to promoting price efficiency, right? So we can't just rely on the financial analyst, okay? Now, I want to cover one more application, and this is related to some of the stuff that I'm currently working on, and the title of this slide will be Stock Picking from Outer Space. So, okay, so you, you probably can't, see what's happening here. I was kind of running out of ideas on the ground, <laughs> so I had to go to other space. But the idea is very simple. Now, I got access to satellite data with images of retailer parking lot traffic at daily frequencies. And these are daily data feeds of the parking lot utilization. So think of Walmart, and think of the thousand stores across the US, and think of uh, kind of satellites flying over Walmart locations and taking snapshots of specific, uh, at a specific time, usually around noon, um, and kind of measuring how many, what's the parking lot space and what's the utilization in terms of number of cars, right? And using this information across stores, across retailers, over time. So we're talking about over 5 million observations across 67,000 store locations, across 44 major U.S. retailers after 2011 all the way to today. So that's big alternative data. It's alternative in the sense that it's non-financial data that can be used to predict financial outcomes, right? So suppose I have it, but suppose you had access to this information, what would you do with it? This is clearly data within the financial reach of sophisticated investors. So what I did is I, I got the data, I processed the data, created quarterly signals, and then start building trading strategies using the satellite data. So let me give you an illustration. This is the Target store um, uh, that is closest to the Berkeley campus, right? So every day I know what's the um, parking lot space and the utilization, right? So these are the kind of photographs we have, and we extract the signal from this kind of photographs across thousands of locations over time for Target, Walmart, and, and, and uh, you know, many other major retailers. So here's what we find, and uh, that will lead to kind of a bigger issue. So what we find is that what you expect to find is that measuring parking lot traffic from outer space is good, right? It provides timely information for anticipating performance for the quarter. In other words, I can anticipate in advance what the earnings will be for the quarter. Now, the way it works, you have the, uh, the, you have the fiscal quarter, and then typically two, three weeks later, you have an earnings report. Right, so that gives me an edge of three weeks 
ahead of everybody else in terms of anticipating what the market reaction will be to the news for the quarter. Does it sound fair to you? Does it sound fair? Does it sound legal? Yes. It is it is legal, but it sounds a little bit unfair, right? Because we'll see what's unfair about it. Now that creates opportunities for sophisticated investors with access to this kind of data to profit at the expense of somebody else. Now every time there is a transaction where somebody gains, somebody will lose, right? If you pull them together, social welfare doesn't change, but there's definitely a transfer of wealth. There's gonna be a transfer of wealth. And it's not gonna be hedge fund managers trading against hedge fund managers. It's gonna be short sellers and hedge fund managers trading against individual investors. So what I actually show in the data, that every time these guys are making money by using these signals from outer space, on the other end of the trade, you have individual investors. So there is a transfer of wealth from those who don't have access to the data, which is individual investors, to those who do have access to the data. And of course, that raises the question of access inequality, which is somewhat different from income and wealth inequality, but it's feeding into that, right? This question of access inequality to big and alternative data, leaving small investors outside the information loop, creating opportunities for sophisticated investors without necessarily improving market efficiency. If you go back to the 60s, people would say, oh, we have more data, the market will instantaneously process this information, the price will be more efficient. Uh-uh, not so fast because these sophisticated hedge fund managers, they're hiding their trades. So it's very hard for the outside investors to learn what's going on. So usually what you get is a transfer of wealth from those who don't have access to the data to those who do have access to the data. Now, this is all legal. This is not insider trading, but it does sound like the line separating public information from material non-public information, that line is getting more blurry over time, right? So what is public? And one would say, well, you know, you can go to the Richmond location and sort of measure cars, right? And you can do this every day. Right? It's, it's a public information. You can just go and count the cars. And you can do this every day for 70,000 stores over 10 years. I mean, you can't really do that, right? So what are, what, what, what are the limits separating public information from material, not public information? And let me tell you something. This satellite data, this is old news. Things are changing. Things are becoming more complicated. Every time we kind of move around with our smartphones, right, and all these applications we have, Many of them are collecting geolocation data, and this geolocation data are now being acquired by hedge fund managers. So now I don't have to take like this blurry satellite images from outer space on a specific day, on a specific time of the day, but throughout the day I can track traffic inside the store of a retailer using this kind of data, right? And of course, you know, not even I as an academic can access this data. But it raises the question of what are the implications of access and equality to data for capital markets in a market setting where the meaning of public information is changing. What do you think? What do you think? Yes. It makes me think that instead of doing my own investing, I want to pay somebody who is a professional who has access to as much information as possible. Well. Suppose you do that, the evidence suggests that professional money managers have uh, on average underperformed the passive benchmarks and they charge significant management fees. So you could do that, but the evidence suggests they're gonna be sacrificing wealth because they don't have managerial ability is not very persistent and they don't, they're not super skillful in terms of beating the market on a consistent basis. Other alternatives. It's like all other signals will eventually be arbitrage away. Because other market participants will enter and use the signal and drive down the value of the signal to zero. So it will be a temporary wealth transfer of course. So as the technology is evolving and the signal becomes more available to everyone, right, they will be arbitrage away. But then other signals will come along, right? That's the normal process of capitalism. Not capitalism, but of, cap active of capital markets, so getting an edge, but it used to be the case that you're getting an edge in two ways. First, the superior ability, superior ability to process financial data. So 
everybody can read the 10K, but some people were better in terms of reading the 10K. So I met Jim Chanos a couple of weeks ago. He's a famous short seller. He walks around with the 10K, right? So his ability has been boiled down, unless you know I'm missing something, right? In terms of the ability to process fun, uh, financial data in the public domain, domain in a superior way. So that's an edge. Other people have tried to generate an edge is through insider trading, right? So just get the information from the insiders. And of course, that's clearly illegal, and that has been heavily regulated. I'm not saying it's not happening anymore, but because there's so much scrutiny, you have to be stupid as an insider too, or reckless to, to, to do that because you're gonna get caught, right? So the meaning of insider trading is changing as the nature of the data is changing, right? So I guess one thing to do is to abstain from trading. One way to go would be to sort of rely on these passive ETFs that are well diversified, Fidelity, Just Loans and ETF, I'm not promoting Fidelity, but the Just Loan and ETF that is well diversified has zero management fees. Zero management fees, and that's gonna be the new boundary, it will be zero management fees, because they don't make their money from management fees, they make their money from uh, uh, lending their shares to arbitrageurs. Because as there is more passive investing, there is more opportunities for active investors, and there's more opportunities for uh, short sellers, so these guys, they provide their shares uh, in the securities lending market as supply. So, but another question is what the SEC should do in terms of uh, regulating potentially this market. So far the focus has been on the bright side of data. More data is better for capital markets, but there might be a darker side to the rise of this data. And the line separating public from material non-public information is getting more blurry. So I think there is a, a, an interesting legal question here. And sophisticated investors are increasingly rely on such data and data that is more out of reach for individual investors. So it's not so much about reading the 10K in a better way, it's getting access to this kind of data. And now, of course, the question I have for the SEC and for all of you is what should be the role of regulators in terms of leveling the field for individual investors? Because if you go back to the mission statement of the SEC, their mission is not to protect investors in general. Their mission is to protect Main Street individual investors, right? And that's why insider trading was regulated in the 80s, and that's why you know many of the regulations came along, but they're in the business of protecting individual investors. Should they be concerned about this rise of the use of private data in, 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 uh, in, in, um, uh, by sophisticated investors and data that individual investors don't have access to? It's an open question. What happened um, after I wrote this paper and it was circulated, it got picked up by the Atlantic. So I'll be sharing with you through, we have a website or, okay, I'm gonna send you the article so that you can read kind of the different perspectives. But it's an interesting question. I'm trying to get it to, to get SEC to be engaged in that conversation. And I think I'm getting their attention and we'll see what happens. But I'm gonna follow up on this one. So more generally, I have two more minutes. Yes. There is a problem, and the problem, I call it the problem of access and equality. I feel that financial data analysis is the key to investment decision making, and professional investors have access to models and data, but at the same time, individual investors don't have access to data and don't have access to a framework for financial analysis, which is crazy if you think about it. There has been so much improvement in the technology and there's been so much growth in data, yet accessing data in a way that is comprehensible for individual investors hasn't really improved. I'll give you an example and some of my students that were in the class remember that. In my class, we use Bloomberg and Faxon. And these are data vendors that we pay significant amounts of money every year hundreds of thousands of dollars to get access to so that our students can use financial data in a more uh, accessible way. Now, what these data vendors do, all they do is they aggregate data that is already in the public domain. If you look at their software, it's like traveling back in time. Like it looks so outdated. And of course they have no incentives to improve their software because you know, there's only two of them, we're gonna buy it anyway, because going back to the raw data is very hard even nowadays. So this is the problem of access and equality to financial information analysis. Individual investors, as a result, make mistakes, and sometimes they lose their savings. So here's my solution to the problem, or my proposed solution to the problem, and discussed this before. 
this idea of democratizing access to financial analysis through the combination of financial education and technology. Now, we can automate and simplify much of the process, right? So what Bloomberg is doing, what Faxit is doing, we can actually do it in a better way. And I'm talking about big data and data analytics, right? Stuff that we already do at Berkeley. Right? So we deal with data and we deal with the, the data analytics. Look at Haas, look at the School of Information, look at computer science. That's all we do, right? So we can come together in the solution business. So we can think of a setting where technology takes care of all the dirty work and provides access to guided financial analysis for everyone for free. Okay, this is effortless data collection, aggregation, and dissemination. And we have the technology and knowledge to do that. So this is the idea of bringing the financial analysis part to the people, hence the, the title of today's session. It starts with access to guided financial analysis, improve investment decision making, and that should mitigate the problem of access inequality to information, right? And hopefully that will give the power of financial analysis back to the people or to the people for the first time. I'm going to skip this slide. I think now this is a very important point, time in history, because access inequality is on the rise, especially as computing power is improving, especially as we get access to more uh, big and alternative data, and there is the need for individual investor protection. Financial technology is booming. The intersection of financial technology is changing the landscape. So that becomes an opportunity for Berkeley to reshape the investment landscape for everyone. This is not just access to trading because now there's many platforms providing access to cheap trading or to zero commission trading. But that doesn't make much sense because you can still lose your entire capital, right? Saving four or five dollars on commissions is not going to save you from the risk of losing your capital. I think this is an opportunity for the Berkeley ecosystem and hopefully you can be part of that. We can be at the forefront of the solution to the problem of access and equality. We have the knowledge, we have the right culture, and I think that fits extremely well with the legacy of our Dean, Dean Lyons, and our defining principles, which is questioning the status quo on behalf of individual investors, but also going beyond ourselves in terms of promoting individual investors. These people make mistakes and we wanna be there for them. Now, of course, you know, in the process, we have to stay confident in what we do, but without attitude, okay? <laughs> now with that, I wanna give you a couple of options as to how you can stay student always. So you can get access to all my research and teaching from this website, so I'm gonna be sharing the deck with the team, and you can access uh, my, my research and teaching. In terms of student always, you can consider the, some of the open exec, the executive ed education programs, but also, this is something different. I want you to consider signing up for free for the Business Review at Berkeley newsletter. So the Business Review at Berkeley is a student organization that I created last year with a group of freshmen who actually took my MBA class, right? Think about it. these are region fellows, like the top 1% of the entering class. I was mesmerized, I was amazed with the quality of our students and I found a way for them to take my MBA class as an independent study, where part of the independent study was basically I just attached the syllabus of my MBA class, but it was incredible. They were able to sort of compete and sometimes outperform my executive MBAs. And they ended up creating this uh, business review at Berkeley organization, which is student-led with a mission to promote our financial acumen on the Berkeley campus. And you have students kind of writing about big ideas in finance, so it'd be great if we support them. And here is some of them, okay? Well, with that, I wanna thank you very much for the opportunity. Nice to have you back. And